When we do autonomic testing, what do we really want to accomplish? Well, obviously, we want to detect if autonomic failure is present or not. That's obvious. Uh, we also want to be able to have tests that allow us to uh, grade the severity of deficits that are present, and also to get some sense as to is this a more localized, oops, a more focal problem, or is this a more widespread problem? Uh, what's the distribution of autonomic failure? And then, in some cases, we're actually able to detect where the lesion is. Is this more of an autonomic neuropathy, a ganglionopathy, or even a central autonomic disorder? And with the right autonomic tests, you, you can uh, narrow that down further. Now, when we choose a test for autonomic function testing, there are certain attributes we would like that test to have in order to implement it into routine testing. Again, there are some obvious ones here. The test has to be sensitive. It has to be specific, obviously. Um, it should also be reproducible from day to day and from week to week. It should be relevant clinically. Um, so obviously, you want to test someone's blood pressure responses if they have blood pressure problems or their, their sweat function if they have sweat problems. So there should be some clinical relevance to it. And the test should have some form of physiological basis. You don't want a black box where you put something in, you don't know what happens, you get some sort of result output, and you don't know really what that result is or means. Um, so it should be physiology based. And then ideally, you want a test that's not invasive, um, that's practical, that you can perform in a 10 year old just as well as in an 80 year old. Um, and you want a test that you can easily implement without being an engineer yourself, a uh, test package that you can purchase um, and uh, get, get, get ready and running uh, without that uh, knowledge. And then you want a test that is well tested and validated for confounding factors other than disease. And we'll get into that in, in detail here in a little bit. So with all that in mind, uh, what I will be talking here mostly is the autonomic reflex screen. This is a test battery that was established over 30 years ago. Uh, Philip Lowe and colleagues were the pioneers getting that uh, battery uh, started. And this standardized testing battery has been essentially unchanged for those past 30 years. It's been extensively validated. It's been used in studies over studies. Uh, we do about 4,000 of those a year at Mayo Rochester alone. And uh, this testing battery has been adopted into commercially available equipment uh, with dedicated software and uh, uh, is available for standardized testing now at other institutions as well and increasingly uh, found across the country. The uh, battery of tests I'm talking about uh, assesses pseudomotor function cardiovascular function and cardiovascular adrenergic function. And I've listed CPT codes here, because if you do a test, you want to be able to bill for it. And in fact, uh, the CPT codes have been built around the tests that I'll be presenting. They cover some other tests as well, but this how, is how they actually got originally started. So the autonomic reflex screen consists of four parts. There's the assessment of pseudomotor function, and specifically postganglionic pseudomotor function, using a test called the Quantitative Pseudomotor Axon Reflex Test, or QSART. Then we look at heart rate responses to deep breathing to assess the uh, cardiovascular function. We look at Vassal maneuver to look at both cardiovascular adrenergic and cardiovascular function. And we look at a head-up tilt, mostly looking at cardiovascular adrenergic function. And this table uh, is, is a little busy, but it basically shows you that the tests we're doing fulfill all those attributes that I mentioned before, sensitive, specific, reproducible, physiologic basis, etc. And so this is really how they got into that battery in the first place. Mm -hmm.